Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Reinvented Legal Business, the case studies series. Just delighted to kick the series off for 2022 with what I know is going to be an absolutely amazing presentation on alternative contracting. As folks will know, this is a series that looks at people doing legal businesses uh, differently, whether that's legal practice or whether it feeds into legal practice or naturally flows from it, or is just doing something really cool in the legal ecosystem. So really delighted to welcome uh, Peter Corner, who's the founding manager of Alternative Contracting, and Professor Camilla Bash Anderson, who is a professor at uh, UWA Law School and head of Comic Contracts, the Comic Contracts team. If you are not familiar with the work that Camilla is doing, please do access other resources, uh, particularly our Future 50 series where we chatted with Camilla about that. But you'll also see the connection between that and the presentation today as well as we go along. So with that intro, I'm going to drop off screen um, for the moment, Peter and Camilla, but I'll be listening in the background and will probably re-emerge and reappear throughout this presentation as well. But again, absolutely delighted to have you. Thank you for kicking off our series this year. And I'm really looking forward to this presentation on alternative contracting. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very, very much for hosting this for us. Um, as it was said, I'm Peter Corner, and I'm the founder of Alternative Contracting, and, and I have to have some connection with Camilla, Professor Anderson. We are only about hmm, six feet apart right now because uh, we do we are married, <laughs> um, and, and it's her work that very much inspired the existence of Alternative Contracting. Um, she. Uh, came up with the idea of uh, making contracts in comic book form. Um, but as she does it as a university project, it does take years and cost a lot of money because everything is tested very thoroughly and, and very carefully. Um, and that meant that small businesses were turned away. But this is such a good idea and the feedback is so good. And when you see them, they're so inspiring that I decided to see if you did it commercially and you did actually cut corners and, and allow imperfection to pass through how cheap and how fast could you make them so they could actually be accessible for a much wider. And that's what I do for a living now. Um, so most of the projects I do are still to some degree collaborations with UWA. Not all of them, but many of them are because the, the general idea we both run with is if something is done for the first time, we will involve UWA or Sometimes they will involve me, um, but once, but more and more contracts becoming routine and doesn't need that much work. So, so starting with the obvious, can law fault not to change? Um, and uh, as the joke picture there says, um, now you, you can continue slow decline into obsolescence. Um, legal disruption is coming. Um, the world has become more global. Um, and legal cost is rising through the roof. And particularly here in Australia, the cost of litigation is now the highest anywhere in the world. And that is one of the main key uh, indicators of whether a country is good to do business in, and it is keeping Australia back. Um, so, so we do need to think of new ways of having the legal profession run if we want to be competitive. Um, to avoid this, um, going around, around in circles and drowning in papers. We, we all have stories. My little, this is one of the few pictures I've ever drawn um, of the end user license agreement with illustrating a Herod clause. For those of you who don't know, a Herod clause is a, a hidden clause that says something absolutely ridiculous. Um, it, it was common for a while that if you went to music festivals, um, you and you had used the free Wi-Fi there, as you probably would, you would, when you click, I accept, have accepted that you were responsible for cleaning all the portaloos before you left the music festival. Um, and whether or not these end user license agreements that make you, well, the ones that actually make you sell your child, probably not legal, but cleaning the toilets in exchange for free Wi-Fi might be enforceable. No one's ever tried um, to enforce them, but technically, um, 
I have, when I started working in this, tried to use, to read some of the end user life agreement I'm presented with. Ironically, when I made my homepage, um, I went through all the different homepage um, I could use. And I read all the terms of the agreement. I found one I liked, I agreed to it. And then the end user license agreement came up, which probably repeated what I've just read. Maybe it didn't, because it couldn't read it, because it was page after page of nonsense. Um, and, and that's what we think we need to get rid of. Contracts that, that just obfuscates, doesn't have any value. But it's not just that people can't understand them. Incomprehensible contracts breathe conflict. Um, and I very much love that picture of the two people with the angry masks. Um, many contracts, when we see them, they are what's called punitive instruments. That means they have these um, elements where if you break the contract, horrible, horrible things will happen to you. But the thing is that most of them are fake. Um, any responsible company that goes out and sues its customers and, and does horrible, horrible things to them because they broke some part of their contract, they will get a terrible reputation very, very fast. The amount of money companies spend on, on trying to look positive and virtuous makes it absurd that they would ever sue a customer over a breach and demand, you know. Many companies have um, contracts that if you leave the company, you can't work in that profession for X amount of years, non-competition clauses that they don't enforce because it again would make people not want to work for them if it ever came out that they were there, but they are. So there's all these pointless punitive clauses in contracts that don't serve any purpose other than making even harder to read. So we believe in what's called behavioral drivers. We believe that you should build the contracts to get the relationship you want. You should put values in it. You should uh, emphasize problems, not so, so if you know that most people complain about um, when the rent is due, then when the rent is due is what you need to illustrate with a picture and make up front and, and center. Because presumably the contract you're making is fair. Presumably you run a company that has a good product to offer. So there's nothing you should be ashamed of. So if you present the problematic things up front, you might get a little bit of a, a wobble there, but you won't have the actual lawsuits at the end. You won't have angry customers ranting on Facebook about all the trouble that you're making, Camilla. So if I can just jump in, I, absolutely. And I think as a researcher, it's important to point out that we didn't make up relational contracting. Oh, no. um, Malmström and Holm got a, a big Nobel Prize for suggesting that it's a good idea to keep relations friendly in contract context, and they proved the economic efficiency of relational contracting, which has been around since the 60s. What, what we're simply doing is making illustrations to help focus that relational aspect of the contract, to really drive it into the main uh, forefront, and that's very valuable. Those images help to do that, because otherwise it's so easy to forget what the relationship is really about with the legal jargon, but the pictures really drive it home. Coming from a historian point of view, uh, having good client relations started before the 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but the word relational contracting, this is... <laughs> I, I want to ask you folks a, a question here about that as well, because now we have like the benefit of being able to do an analysis of a whole bunch of different sorts of contracts to see what clauses are actually used or matter or whatever. And, and I'm sure that you're, I know you're going to get onto the techie part of it in a second, but I'm sure that that has informed and should also be informing um, legal practices about, you know, how to embrace these sorts of things or even how they're drafting you know, text-based contracts. Is, is that a fair comment? I think, would you like me to answer that? Or? Yes. Uh, yeah. Both of you, <laughs> both of you, go for it. Well, my, my, <laughs> I, I was expecting Camilla to start talking. I would just put in that um, one of the things we learn constantly and relearn and relearn is that every industry is different. Uh, and even every business within every industry is different. So, so where the problems are is different for each company. Um, so it's, I mean, comparing two contracts the, the companies would have to be doing the same thing in the same geographic location to the same customers for it to be completely fair. Um, so this, it is hard to compare directly. Mm. 
Yeah, but what I would add to that is it's re it's really important what you're saying, Terry, because we have to be aware as legal professionals, which of course Peter isn't a legal professional, he's, he's a legal service industry support. Um, so he sees this from the outsiders and probably much healthier point of view. But the legal professionals often get lost in our paranoia yeah. and what we think we can help our clients with by drafting just in case it happens. But we're then actually not drafting contracts for them. We're drafting contracts for our own peace of mind just in case something really unlikely happens. And, and what this project is doing and other projects like it is, is trying to do, as you say, focus on what's actually the key issues in a contract dialing them down to the most basic, important relational aspects, putting values in there, and then trusting the legal system to fix anything that might come up with the focus on those behavioral drivers for the performance of the contract and the basic understanding and ensuring everyone's on the same page. And of course, we have a lot of data and statistics that can look at those clauses. But as Peter points out, every contract, every project we worked on has been different and we need to go through our own risk assessment and pain, uh, pain points um, individually for each one of them to make sure that we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong in research which is why it's great to be a researcher because we can afford to get it wrong and try again um, but it is very important that, that we stop drafting contracts for lawyers and start drafting them for the people who are actually using them and we need to use them as a manual for their contractual relationship rather than something they never ever look at and they throw at someone else's lawyer in case something goes wrong and i think we're still we're still often stuck in that box of it's innovative if we use plain English or, or plain whatever your, your, your language is in your country um, because that really helps our clients. But this is like going way beyond that in terms of the user experience and, and you know, being able to actually allow people to understand their obligations. Love it. Love it. There's also a point I would like to say, possibly, which is weird because I'm saying it as someone who comes from outside the profession uh -huh. of the lawyer, and that is, it's weird that when you craft contract, you don't trust the legal system. Mm. Because if something goes catastrophically wrong, if you hire someone to work in your company and he steals all the money and he runs away, you don't actually need a clause that says you can't steal all the money and run away. It's already illegal. The police will already <laughs> come and deal with this. Yeah. Right? Most of these grossly immoral things people can do, they're already covered by the law. It's not like if you forget to put it in your contract, then you're completely unprotected. You rent a house out and it's burned down. There is yes. a legal recourse. And it's a, great, it's a great way of looking at it, Peter, because it's also reconceiving uh, in a way or reimagining where all of those pieces are and how you can bring them together um, in, a, in a way that's user-friendly. So I, I just love that. And, and I'm going away now, but I'll come back. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Well, I will move on. Um, this is a leftover slide from older presentations um, <laughs> from, from Camilla's, but embracing legal tech. Um, technology is moving ahead. Computers are entering this industry too. Um, and, and it means that lawyers have to consider what services they actually bring if, if much of what used to be experience and know-how can be made by a computer program and sold to you in a company headquartered in a country with low labor costs. So I, I usually jump on a soapbox here and talk about humanizing the legal profession and embracing the opportunity of legal tech to start humanizing, but we can move on. I just It's important for me to get the message out there. Um, but this is where I originally jumped in. Um, Camilla was very excited by the use of images in a legal contract. And it is exciting, but when you come at it from a historical point of view, it, it doesn't seem that you know, innovative because all the old legal textbooks were illustrated. Um, uh, the, it's, the legal textbooks stopped being illustrated when the Reformation broke church and state apart. And somewhere in that divorce, the church managed to get custody of all the pictures, leaving the law books rather incomprehensible. But we do use images already, as you can see there in the background, where, where would our traffic law be without images? And if you go on an airplane ride, if you can remember airplanes from pre-COVID, uh, um, your, your safety instructions will be all visual because they don't know what language you can read. And those safety guides are inspiringly well made. I mean, they're kind of a gold standard for visualization. So we have used visual images in law. We've even used exclusive visual images in law. And, and it is very much possible to do. 
these are two of the most important uh, contracts that kicked off the ball over six years ago, and I can't believe it's been that long. So the one on top left is the uh, comic book strip, or one of the comic book strips created for the UWA Makers Club, which was created as a concept one night in Brisbane uh, many years ago when my colleague Adrian Keating from engineering tried to salvage a excellent academic unit that was in trouble because the unit was about engineering students working with real life projects in industry and they were signing NDA agreements and, and presenting their new uh, emerging skill sets in industry and it was a great opportunity for everyone except they had no idea what an NDA agreement was so they would sign it and get overexcited down the cast and start talking about it and there was a real issue because it was a lawsuit waiting to happen as any lawyer who's listening to the story is now inwardly cringing thinking about the liability that the university would be taking on by not ensuring that its students abided by its NDA agreements. So what Adrian said was, why does it have to be so difficult? Why does it have to be so unfriendly? Why are lawyers so awful? And he used a lot of choice words. And I said, oh, for heaven's sake, Adrian, and I put down my martini. What do you want, a comic book strip? Um, and he said, yes, why not? <laughs> and so we did it. Unbeknownst to me, at the other side of the world, at exactly the same time, you know, you think you're doing something original, uh, the wonderful Robert DeRoy, who runs Creative Contracting, was about to create his first uh, contract that was specifically drafted for people with very low literacy or no literacy. So for fruit pickers and domestic workers, the one that we see there on the bottom left is from the Clement Gold contract, which is available at creativecontracting.com. Um, and they actually came out at pretty much the same time. So Robert and I aren't competing to say which one was the first uh, because they were created simultaneously. Isn't the world a strange place? But they received a lot of interest in the press and in the legal profession generally. Um, and soon after that, I started getting sponsorship for my research in this, which, to be honest, was just supposed to be a favor for a friend. But this is what happens when you do something weird. So that's when I started getting really busy. So the Oricon was our first major sponsor at UWA, and we're very grateful. We remain very grateful to Oricon because not only did they sponsor the research with money, they also let us play with their contracts and create these visual employment contracts. I'm just going to pause you for one second. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to point out that we talked about behavioral drivers before, and this is one of uh, the displays here in, in the top one, um, emphasizing that if you don't break the NDA, everyone can make money and, and you can get celebrated and you can get credit for it. It's that emphasis on the positive outcomes of following the contract for everyone. It, it, it's one of the, still one of the clearest examples. You can talk more. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so thank you for that. So the employment contract that we developed at UWA uh, for Oricon is now rolled out across seven different uh, countries in the world. Uh, each of them has had to adapt specifically both to regional laws, but also to regional interpretations of images. It's been a very, very interesting project. Um, and it's available on the comic book contract page. We learned so much from that in terms of developing avatars and developing those behavioral drivers. We even as we simplified a lot of the clauses, including the one that, that Peter alluded to before, some of the anti-competition clauses, they found the cutting room floor because they weren't very nice once they were illustrated. Um, but we also put things in there, actual pain points from human resources. My favorite example is the timesheet. Um, lawyers are very familiar with young uh, recruits who don't understand the significance of putting their timesheets in on time, and so are engineers. Uh, and it's a big frustration for anyone who runs a business if the timesheets don't come in time so you can bill your clients. That is now explained in the Oracle employment contract. And since then, human resources are reporting that young recruits don't sin as much on this particular point. So it's not just about editing and making things simple. It's about identifying the actual behaviors that need to be addressed and putting them into the contract so that it can work as a manual. The latest, so we've had a lot of projects since then, and the latest one is uh, the one that we've done for Bank West, which if, if you're here in, in WN and you haven't heard about it, then I don't know where you've been because it's on television, buses, and there's even a huge billboard. Um, <laughs> but what we've done is we've taken the uh, product schedules for uh, Bank West easy transaction accounts and, and others, and we've turned them into a comic book. Um, it took nearly three years and it, it was a, a very well-funded project. We remain very grateful to Bank West for this. But my absolute crowning achievement was the other day when I saw a LinkedIn post from someone I, I didn't even know going viral because he had taken a picture of the comic book that he received about his bank account. And then he posted it on LinkedIn and he said, this is the first product schedule I've ever read. 
well done Bankworth. And when you, when you see something like that, you get really excited. But of course, next slide, it's not just I would, about- I would, that It is one of the, from, we're gonna go through a lot of benefits, but from a private business point of view, the PR benefits of these projects are enormous. I mean, the, the positive feedback, the impression people get of your company is really positive. Absolutely. So the three categories, as you can see here, that we've been testing this, and as remember, it's a research project, um, has been comprehension, engagement, and perception. And the data that you're about to see on, on the stats that we've run across these projects will show you that as we've looked at comprehension, engagement, and perception individually, the key one where we've found surprisingly the biggest increase has, has not just been comprehension engagement, which we knew we were going to see an increase there, but perception is far above the one that has, has the greatest increase. So exactly what Peter's saying is the perception, the marketing aspect, the, the, the pure goodwill of consumers and employees in finally being able to read and understand and to some extent even enjoy their contracts is absolutely golden. So we've started up a new strand of my research uh, with the marketing department here at UWA, looking at the, the, the potential of marketing transparent law, because it's, it's huge. And I often found myself sponsored by the marketing department of these larger corporations that we help to visualize their law. But yeah, so if we can go on, the first uh, advantage that we saw was improved onboarding. Um, and it's very simple because we're able to create manuals for the employment relationship that are friendly and, and work as guides for reference. Even people who can't read are reportedly keeping them in their back pockets and on, the, on the floor and the shop floors on the fruit picking floors and, and they're referring to them as a constructive framework for their work. Oricon is also reporting huge time savings because we were able to incorporate a lot of the onboarding training in the actual contract itself with electronic links and quizzes. Um, they have reported a huge transition to the workplace. I regularly get really lovely emails from people I've never met saying, you know, did you do that Oricon contract? I just joined Oricon. And yeah, it was awesome. I loved it. And it's such a lovely thing because it wasn't just about simplifying the law. It was also about creating a spirit of relationship, of, of innovating from the very beginning. When, when it comes to employment contract, which is one of the key things we do, um, but, but all contracts should be the basis of the relationship, right? That, that is the legal rules for the oncoming relationship. So it's the skeletons to which you build everything else on. So things like onboarding and uh, rules, dress codes for your office and so on, they, it's logical to attach them onto the contract. And if the contract is never read, you're lacking your skeleton and, and everything else will be a bit wobbly. It's very true. And we have data that shows that across the companies that have allowed us to monitor it, they keep uh, electronic copies of, of the actual employment contract and employees are regularly referring to it because it provides a great framework for the training and information that they've received. So they actually are treating it like the manual for the relationship. And I don't know how many people listening have actually read or reread their employment contracts, but I can assure you it's not something I'm in the habit of doing. So I think it does require a very special kind of- It is empowering to understand your employment contract. It is. And that's exactly why Robert DeRoy has received significant funding from the Hague Institute of Legal Innovation um, for his, his access to justice work in empowering employees to understand their rights better. And we've also received a lot of recognition for some of the work we've done with, with disabled people um, and with WAIS. Um, and there, I don't know if it's still running, but there was an access to justice um, exhibit called Graphic Justice at the uh, Queensland Supreme Court, which sadly I wasn't able to visit myself because of COVID, but they were exhibiting our work and, and labeling it as access to justice improvement. So that's, that's a huge additional aspect to the work that we do. So here you've got some boring stats. I am a, an academic and admit it, you expect this, but basically what it boils down to is after a two year longitudinal uh, psychometric testing, we were able to look at the points difference in appreciation and, and positive feedback on the three categories of comprehension, engagement, and perception. So I hasten to add that I am not really well versed in these psychometric studies. I've got psychologists on my team who do this for me, but they assure me that these are quite significant points differences in the way that things are weighted. Um, and as you can see in the data, comprehension is increased, greatly increased, I'm told which is the, the data that shows how well people understand it. We've done some focus group testing to actually test people's understanding of their contracts, text-based versus image-based. 
engagement, you know, how well do people uh, engage with it? How long do they take to read it? We can monitor these things when we, when we test people electronically and it's hugely up. Even when they know they're being tested, they spend more time on the comic book. It takes a lot to, less to read. Um, and they also seem to be engaging much better with it, rifling through it much more comprehensively. And then the statistic that's gone up the most is the perception step, which is the one I was talking about before. The, the positive feedback that people get from someone actually taking the time to create something transparent for them to understand their contractual relationship has been very overwhelming. And, and I'd like to point out if you'd gone to alternative contracting, that would have been a better looking graph. <laughs> Thank you. I'll let my RAs know. The final stat, the one that we're very proud of, and which I've got to say I, I was absolutely sure wouldn't last, um, is dispute elimination. Uh, so, yep, drum roll. Uh, when we rolled out in, across the major banking sector, we, we've just been holding our breath for just over a year now, waiting for something to come up, because there is an abundance of disputes and litigation in the banking sector. But still, we hold this statistic so far, to my knowledge, that there have been no disputes of any kind in any of these illustrated comic book contracts anywhere. In fact, we've seen dispute elimination across sectors that are used to having a lot of disputes, like the fruit picking industry, which have a lot of, of manual labor workers who don't always understand the framework for their employment, it's gone away. We have also not seen a single, across 300,000 banking and contracts, not a single dispute has come up yet. It's quite surprising. Um, the, the fruit picker story is actually one of the stories I really like. Um, there used to be this problem among the fruit pickers that they would just disappear. And the people who owned the plantations thought that they just went away, got a better job, just didn't even care to say that they were leaving. Um, then these contracts rolled out. Turned out that the fruit pickers sometimes, for cultural reasons, had to go to a wedding, a funeral. That was non-negotiable. They had to or go. a sick child. Yeah. But then they figured that they, why would the, the guy who owned the plantation let them go to a funeral? It's clearly they betrayed his trust by leaving so they would just slink out at night ashamed that they were abandoning such a good job um so it turned out the food pickers actually were so appreciative of their job that they were ashamed that they had to leave for a day and never came back well, whereas they, the people they realized they had were the right so sad that they kept losing their workers the moment the pickers realized they could just have leave for a day the problem just disappeared it, you know we give workers things like maternity leave for a reason, because we want to entice them to stay. If, if your workers don't know the privileges you're giving them, then you don't get the positive side effects of them. You, you need to communicate your own generosity or it's pointless. I've, I've, really I've jumped in here because I think that it kind of underscores the that comment that we were making earlier about reframing or rethinking about what we're doing as lawyers. Yeah. You know, if if the if the end result of a contract is that everybody understands their obligations clearly, so that there's the opportunity to avoid dispute, and as you were saying earlier, earlier Peter, you know, all of the fallout that comes from that, which can be can be massive if it's if it's a really acrimonious dispute, then 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 this has got to be something that we're looking at seriously, right? It's it's got to be, but it is also taking our mindset out of where we're here to just focus on eliminating the risk no matter what, even if we produce something at the end of the day that nobody understands or can work with, versus who are we actually serving with this? Who are the stakeholders? Who's going to be using this? And let's produce something. And I know we're going to come to one of my favourite points in just a second, Camilla, so I'm not going to steal your thunder. Something that can be, you know, actually really useful so i just want to say bravo on that point and again i will go away <laughs> well thank you Derek. but you don't have to go away um i have, i've actually got a postdoctoral um economic student who's currently doing a law and economics analysis of the economic impact of the dispute elimination of these contracts and it's quite interesting what she's unearthing and i can't wait to to share the, the findings but we still have comic book contracts on such a relatively small scale across the globe that it's difficult to measure the impact. I mean, we, we, this drum roll page is a little bit of an annoyance for us because we're really waiting for one of our contracts to hit a courtroom and the judge saying, of course it, it's fine. Well, but we don't really need it. <laughs> we don't really need it, but it would be nice to finally say, yes, they're bulletproof. Uh, 
Um, a year and a half ago, we had a really interesting landmark case in the UK, uh, which built on the Starbev case, where a judge quite inequivocally stated that in an in a interpretation between an image that was submitted as part of a contractual negotiation and a clause in a contract, he deemed that the clause was less likely to have been read and the image was much more likely to have been part of the negotiation and, and therefore the image was prioritized above the wording. I thought that was a very important case. And yeah, as an academic, I think heavily on that. So, um, but that's awesome. We don't need to be told that they're binding. Uh, any lawyer will tell you there's no form requirement on contracts. And if you don't trust any lawyer, then, then trust uh, former chairman of uh, Robert French, our former Chief Justice, who is, is now the Chancellor at UWA. And he was very kind in 2017 at the Comic Book Contract uh, Conference to give the closing address where he very clearly said that, of course, these contracts are binding. The real challenge here is to what extent they can be interpreted and be given meaning. And as a researcher, that's one of the places where I, I really am very intrigued. We do our utmost, as Peter said earlier, to ensure that every industry, every demographic, every specific geographic area, every target audience is carefully checked to make sure that they understand the images in, in the way that it's intended. Um, because it is the interpretation that's going to come down to a potential problem if there is going to be one. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> it, it's not just that ours is, is binding, but there has been uh, some movement in the courts where the alternative isn't. There was a case in England where two big companies had a dispute, and the judge made the point that this contract they signed was so complicated that no one in either company could actually read it. Neither CEO knew what it said. The only people who knew what it said were the two law firms they contracted to. So was the signatures on the contract actually binding with only, wasn't this just two law firms that had agreed something if neither of their clients understood it? It's a really good point. I, I remember well when we had that discussion, that was- yes, that was the yeah. Dean of Oxford who told us that story. <laughs> <laughs> that well, yeah, it was very good. It was fantastic to have a conversation with him about this. my old mentor. Yeah. So yeah, so thank you. But I mean, as this, if you're interested in this and you're listening, then I would encourage you to click on the link on this slide if you have access to it. It's uh, it's from what I believe to be the first comic book uh, law article in a law review, um, drawn by uh, Bruce Mutard, and um, it's absolutely fantastic. Everything so, will be in comic books in the future. Everything will be in comic. Well, I'm not sure about that, honey. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, I will talk a bit about avatars. This is one of Camilla's earlier contracts too. Uh, Waze is an amazing company that helps uh, people with disabilities to hire um, people to come and help them around the house. Everything from cleaning to anything they need really. Um, so in the initial draft of the contracts to differentiate between the boss and the client, they put a little nurse's cap on the, um, not the client, on their helper. And that created havoc because you absolutely are not a nurse if you are hired to come and clean uh, people in a person in a wheelchair's home. You're not allowed to touch medicine at all. You're not insured for that. Well, you might be, but you're not necessarily. And it turned That's... out as we did this big gaff that the entire health support industry had been struggling to get away from the nurse's image for decades. And so that initial image was, was terrible. We made so many mistakes on this project. And there was a whole, we've written a whole article about all the mistakes we made, which is, which is interesting, but. Then but there the was point. the version where the down there in the corner, where the, where the helper is in pink, that triggered rage because that indicated apparently that the helper was female. I, I hate that. Statistically, there is a very good chance of, but absolutely wasn't allowed to indicate. Um, but yeah, and it wasn't our intention at all. Those were just the standard no. uh, waste Those colors. Those are the waste things. colors, uh, teal and pink. But we made a lot of mistakes, but I think in the interest of time, probably best just to summarize the main. Yeah, the main I, point. I mean, the main thing is that we have learned that we need to be incredibly careful with gender, sexual orientation, age. Body uh, image, demographics. Yeah everything even higher they are always bespoke for the organization because for some organizations there are certain indicators um but they are very they are, i'm going to come with two examples later where it is humans as the avatars but that is quite rare now because it is 
um, a minefield to step into and you have to be incredibly careful about the avatars. And also the avatar, because it will appear all over the contract, is a very good way place to start putting values in. If you look at the line back here, this avatar, the Oricon is this massive international company of incredible competence. And its avatar is a round little short cute thing to make it look unscary on purpose. It, that's a very unscary character in the contract. Um, that's there is actually either. one drawing in the Oricon contract where, where Oricon Bobby, as he's called, is very big and he's got steam coming out of his ears. And that's in the misconduct section. Yeah. There's the one area where he's bigger than the light bulb, which is the avatar of the employee, and where he's actually angry. Um, yeah. Because the employer is allowed to become angry if there is serious misconduct. Yeah. More dis disciplinary. That's one of the other lessons we've learned. We need to operate as teams, and we need lots of different professions in there, particularly historians, obviously. But sometimes also people with law degrees can be useful. Psychologists, economic, depends on the contract. But the greatest expert you're going to have on your team is usually the client. They're the ones who know um, their employees or, or their clients. And the more information you can get from them, the better a contract you can make. Um, the other key person on the team is the visualizer. Um, whether it's so these, this is from a contract where you sponsor an artist's workspace and, and equipment in exchange to get an equal discount if you buy the art at the end. And this had to be visualized and there were problems and problems of how to even write this down in a way that artists would understand. Until the artist it. sitting in the room took a napkin and drew this picture on it. And then that problem was. Oh, I remember that so well. So I was, we were having a meeting, and, and the artist happened to be present, and and he for another reason. And we kept discussing this concept and how could we possibly visualize it? Because at that point we were so stupid, we actually thought it was our job to tell him what to draw, um, instead of just giving him a, a challenge for how to visualize what to draw. So we we had identified the behavior and we brought it down to well, we already own part of your art if we sponsored you, so we would, would, if we choose to buy it, we. And we, but how do we vision? And in the end, he was like, but I, yeah, but, you know, not now, Louis. And then he just drew that on a napkin. It was like, oh, yeah, of course. That's, yeah, okay. UWA has sponsored you, but already the piggy bank. Yeah, good. The, the other one is obviously very simple. My, my little ball thing, it's from my own contract to my clients. But it's, again, it explains the, the procedure for a generic contract, how it's made. It's, it's illustrated like this to point out the way that Constant feedback will make a better contract. So, so I will do something and I'll bounce it to you. And, and, and you are in built part of the process. And these visualizations, they really help drive through a point. And I really love this one because it helps to manage expectations. And I think managing expectations is one of the goals of transparent communication in these visual contracts. So we fly forward. Uh, yay. yay! This is the... Uh, construct. This is a document that outlines all the procedures for building a new home in Queensland. It's the Queensland's Building Commi Con Construction Committee. It's still draft. It hasn't come out yet. This is the first time I get to show it off. But this is the launch, right? So this is the worldwide is launch, the launch of the, of the QPBC building contract. Yes. Um, so again, um, starting out by pointing out that we are building a partnership, trying to put the values in here. This is a project in which you will be involved. Um, the pictures um, are the actual consumer building guide that has to be confirmed whenever there's a document in this contract. It's a picture of the actual document, making it extra easy for the user this to make sure they have the right document. Um, you can see down there on, on number four with arms swinging back and forth. There's a lot in a building of a new home where documents have to change hands in the right order um, in order for steps to go ahead, um, which when you write it down ends up really complicated. When I got the paperwork first, it was a lot of separate documents um, linking together. Um, so, so I think my artist here, Louis Celeste, has done a very good job of illustrating the flow of documents and, and money payments throughout and if you follow this draft you will get a very good overview of the procedure of building a home and when and what will happen so 
I'm very happy. I think it's a credit to QBBC because I remember they, they contacted me initially to see whether uh, we could yeah. do a research project, but it was it was just too impractical to get it off the ground. And so I think they were, they were some of your first clients, weren't they, Peter? Uh, technically num number two, yes. So I think it's an absolute credit to them that they, they, they were not afraid to try this and no, it's great no. to see it come out. It's, it's a big document, it is, but it, it has these, these wonderful managements of expectations again. Yeah. And, and it, it's again one of those industries where, where people want to build a new home. There are some scary stories about getting in bed with builders who you shouldn't have gotten in bed with. It's probably the biggest investment you'll ever make in your life. Um, it's a very big project and, and being able to render it comprehensible and giving you a schedule you can actually follow, I think that will give a lot of peace of mind to people. I'm very excited about this coming out. Yeah. Um, but in the exact opposite end of the, of the queue, why my company exists, this is a one guy uh, handyman service. This thing was made in less than 14 days and it was very cheap. Uh, it's only, also the only project we've ever worked on um, where there was no pre-existing contract. <laughs> it, it was literally just the handshake agreement before this. Um, on the front page here is, hi, I'm Dave. I guarantee that he's fully insured and so on. Procedure of how he works. And on the back, he will actually print out the quote for the work you've asked for. So this is what you get. The contract. Yes, but I love this and I love the fact that it's just, and the danger of upsetting the lawyers out there, this, this was the easiest project because there was no underlying contract, because there was no uh, expectation that it should mirror the clauses in a pre-existing traditional contract. All it is, is values, expectations, and minimal information required for that relationship. And a, a warranty and, and, a, and a reservation against you know, unforeseen circumstances. Bam, that's all it is. It's so simple, that's all that needs. And Anything we've, above and beyond that, the, the legal system can figure it out if there's And we've heard feedback that this contract is hanging on people's fridges around where we live, which, I mean, that, that's the gold standard. If people take the contract with you and put it on the fridge, you, you've done well. And then they remember to pay him on time, apparently. Yeah, which is, which is also great. And, and they told him back, well, that's also really good. But I, and I think this one took that. less than a week to complete because of the simplicity. It certainly um, took less than 14 days. Um, can't and remember that, and now you're happy to share the cost. I think it was under $2,000, uh, Yeah. It was with illustrations. So that's how cheap it can be done. So I think no, nobody should be scared off by a comic book contract. Oh, no. I mean, I founded this company to see how cheap we can do it to get them out. Um, so yeah, um, again, it, we don't perfect. I mean, obviously it's done in less than 14 days. There were no big groups of people sitting down and doing psychometric testing on this. Um, but my argument for my business is always, as contracts are right now, how can I make them worse? I mean, how do I make a contract worse than something that no one ever reads? So even if the, the product I give you is not absolutely perfect, it's still going to be an enormous improvement. And it does the job. And, and Dave reports that it's, it's improved his client relations and a lot of the problems that he's had with, with getting people to pay on time and the expectation that the site is ready and... It's all clearly communicated there. Um, which goes our constantly expanding scope. Uh, we are working on financial terms and agreement and conditions right now, which is very exciting. We have a project there. A big sponsor we can't name, but it's a joint project between our two companies. Uh, working on multiple medical consent forms, which seems to be a, a market that's going to blow up. It's incredible. Yeah, that has been really interesting. So both consent for actual treatment, but also for research. Uh, it's it's just and, funny and both for, in terms of mental health children, and actual the medical community very much wants yeah. you to understand what they're doing they have to make you understand what they're doing and it's difficult for them and doctors don't have the time to sit down with the patient for long enough so yeah. i think this would be a very big market in the future uh, i've done enrollment for universities illustrated so this were understandable but every time we make a contract there's another one that pops up and we think, wait, that should also be done. There used to be a disclaimer here in, in when we did the first of these presentations years ago that said, um, it's good for many, if not all projects, um, but we've removed the not for all because we haven't really found the wall yet. <laughs> because well, again, 
when I talk, I still I still respect my profession too much. I say, oh, maybe there are contracts that this won't work. And see, where I go, not because they have that things, think, things that shouldn't be in comic contract, but putting a couple of illustrations in a contract makes it easier to read. It makes it I, yeah, but it's not because I don't think you don't change the words. But it's not because I don't think the contract could be better with images. It's because the people working with the contracts may not be ready to make those changes. And if that's the case, then it's too soon. Then, but but then you're going to end up like a London law firm instead of an Amsterdam law firm. We gave oh, a presentation in Amsterdam a few years ago, um, and in Amsterdam it's become normal now to have illustrators attached to the um, law firm. It's not because they're not designers. as far as us, but they, for instance, will have a contract that's illustrated with a penguin because then all documents with a penguin on belongs together. Some key points are illustrated. Graphs are made more professional, so they look better, just to help comprehension. And they are now poaching clients hand and foot from the big firms in London because it's better. They're also poaching uh, talent. Yeah, because they've innovated. Um, the law profession might be hesitant about innovation, but it doesn't look like the law profession's clients are hesitant about innovation. So you sure. kind of have, have to. Um, interpretation is always the big issue as we've already pointed out, needs to be industry specific images. It needs to be cultural specific images, regional specific images, age specific images, which is why everything we do is bespoke. We keep being asked if we can make some kind of generic set of pictures that can illustrate generic points and, and bring them forward. And the answer is so we can make some generic, maybe concepts you can work with. But the maybe images, icons. Maybe icons for a few things. But for now, we really need to work bespoke. Otherwise, we're just going to make a new version of legalese in pictures that people need to have read a book to be able to interpret. Um, There's so many also, of the images that I created for the Oricon contracts for employment that simply didn't work for the same company in a different region because the image would be interpreted differently. And so we just, the, the whole notion of transnational standard also, images, it's not the same things in in not hiring an artist to make six or seven drawings seems so very, very small when you've made a contract that people want to read. Why not make the images specific to your company? Why not make them radiant and, and emphasize the best values of your company? This should be the start of your PR campaign. It's the basis of your relationship with them. Why are you saving pennies to not exploit the opportunity of having someone actually read your contract? It just seems a mad place to start saving. So, so um, for now, we, we're very much in the bespoke images for everything camp. Obviously, we recycle concepts like puzzle pieces behind me fitting together. It's culturally understandable in most of the world and and, and works. Um, but now I'll leave it up to questions about my little baby. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think we've got about ten minutes left for questions. You want to jump in, Terry? Yeah, sure. I wanted to I wanted to ask you a question that kind of flows from the work that you've been doing together, and and also because this is a, a obviously a reinvent legal business series, so it probably focuses more on the aspect of um, business and how that kind of happens. So we've seen, you know, obviously commercialization from work and research that takes place at universities is not new, it's it's still pretty new as far as law schools are concerned. And I guess we've seen a bit of it in relation to particularly in more recent times with legal tech um, development, for example, taking place at universities. But I'm just wondering from, from that business question, where do you see this sort of opportunity, I'm going to call it, developing, where you've got research taking place in a university, of course, um, it's commercialized sometimes partly within the university, but also in the sort of business um, arrangement or setup that you've got where it's almost a private entity or it is a private entity um, that is that is running with that with the appropriate licenses and whatever obviously happening in between. Do you see that as a way forward for research? that falls into that category, Peter, for the sort of business that you're running, how will that continue to come together? Will it come together? Or are you folks just a blip and an outlier as far as this sort of thing is concerned? I, I think, well, 
for, for us, it works incredibly well, but I, I think the basic idea works well. Camilla's research is enhanced by the more contracts are out there, the more data she has to work with. So the more contracts I make, the better. But she, as an academic, is expected to aim for perfectionism. She, she has to, to test and, and aim for that perfect product now, which will mean that her product will always be limited in quantity. So, so the, the symbiosis is very good. And the symbiosis yes. for me of, of seeing these pop, completely publicly available data and, and base my products around that is obviously I've, I've got a free research and development section. That's what university is supposed to do. That's what the <laughs> government keeps prioritizing university funding so they can be our free research and development. Well, he's, he's being falsely modest. He's actually not free because he's also sponsoring uh, a right. research project on, on how these images work well for people in, in anxious positions. We're calling it dramatically the trauma project, but he's co-sponsoring um, a project which is very exciting where we're testing visual contracts versus word-based contracts for people with extreme anxiety or, or nervous traumatic conditions. Um, so because that needed testing, he was, he was willing to put some, <laughs> um, some sponsorship behind that. So that's a great synergy. But also for me, it's incredibly, what he's saying about the multitude of contracts is incredibly valuable. Like the QBBC contract that's just come out, I couldn't take that on as a research project. I, I simply didn't have the capacity to do it. Um, but the fact that, that they were willing to take a chance on this new emerging company um, means that we now have a, a construction contract that they're allowing me to do research on. It's good for them because I can help impact and, and focus group tests on their concepts. But it's really great for me because I've got this new contract that I can write about for my research. Because for me, I mean, every penny that you sponsor for UWA comic book contracts, it's great. And I'm grateful. I help to pay for my RAs and my illustrators and my team. But I don't see any of it myself. My only um, motivation is publication and, and, and getting more impact out there. So the fact that, that I've got alternative working with me on the sidelines on, on contracts that, that are allowing me to further my research is a fantastic synergy. And I don't see why that should be you know, restrained to this blip. You don't have to be married to someone to collaborate with them in private industry. Well, I mean, if you um, work in any industry and there's cutting edge research in that industry at a university, why would you not read those papers? I mean, other than time constraint, why would you not pay attention to cutting edge research freely available at your local university? That just seems mad. Yeah, and I mean, it, and it works in privately. I mean, a lot of the members of my research team, some of my RAs and, and a number of my illustrators are quite happy to also work for Peter and for alternative contracting yeah. and, and double up that way so that mm -hmm. they can, you know, supplement their income for me, which I, is- I know of more than one young person who I think at university right now who's, who's planning on doing something very similar to what I do once they're finished. Hope, thankfully, that the industry I've met here has no limited on its size reality, so yeah. I'm not worried about competition, so go ahead. Um, but but I, I think this project can spawn quite a few jobs. Hmm. I, and I, I, get, I think it already has. It, and I, mean, I guess that's what we saw in Amsterdam. So the, in Amsterdam, when the, the conference that Peter was talking about, um, we actually had the organizer stand up and ask how many people in this conference right now do not have a legal background, um, but are hired in a law firm or working independently as legal designers. And there were 11 of them in, mm. a, in a room of about 50 people. That was quite extraordinary. So let me ask you this follow-up question for the folks that are sitting, sitting there like the person that you've kind of suggested, Peter, that have, have been working on some great research. It, it does lend itself to commercialisation. Maybe that's uh, available within the university. Maybe it's not. What what do you what do both of you suggest that you look for in the right person in the right match to be able to combine together to do what you've done to to be able to commercialize outside the university or or have the sort of relationship that you have I understand that yours to some extent is unique in that your partners in no. business in a way, but also life partners. It's but 25 I, years soon. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure through that, there are probably things that you could distill that one should look for. So what do you, what do you look for well, in mean, that kind of, of industry the, partnership? One of the reasons I did this was because I was homeschooling our artistic sons. So, so going out and working nine to five wasn't an option. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to have a wife who could support me. So I was looking for something to do that I thought was fun, that made a positive difference, uh, and that I could have my brain turned on some more hours of the day. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, so I mean, if you want to start a company that based on the, the outer extreme of, of research, uh, then, then you need to be in a secure enough position to jump off a high space without a parachute. I mean, yeah, there's no guaranteed um, income in the industry sector. I think that's, that's an important thing. There was no income for the first year at all. Uh, yeah. So, but and I think you have to do a, a lot of, I wouldn't say kiss the frog because I enjoy doing this, but you have to do a lot of presentations and interviews and podcasts. And uh, I've given speeches at conferences and at universities across three continents um, because that you, you have to be passionate for it, right? I, I, my, my main victory here isn't to get rich. My main victory is that these contracts spread into the world because I think they make the world a better place. Sure. He's incredibly supportive. But I think to answer your question more generically, I think you have to put together something that complements you. So I can be a bit time poor um, and I can be a bit reluctant to seek new pastures because I'm quite busy with my daytime job. So I need somebody who can do what I can't do, but I don't have the energy to do. Um, I can very much be a people person, but I also need somebody who can go to conferences and, and to, to events. Uh, instead of me and, and wave the flag for this joint venture um, if we see it that way so if you're going to be collaborating with someone in industry you need somebody who's not afraid to take a risk so they can't be financially dependent on the risk that, that they're taking and trying something new and different that puts too much stress on it i think our marriage does give me an advantage because i'm not afraid of disagreeing with camilla and that i think can be i mean i've seen other people inter interact with professor anderson and they tend to just agree with everything she says because she's yeah. Professor Anderson and she's not an easy person to say you're wrong to but I do I do have the advantage here having learned how to say you're wrong you know, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Year period. a match in personality but also a compliment to the to the thing be honest about what you might be lacking as a researcher or as a private sector person what kind of personality do you need to complement what you might be missing yeah so you certainly have a unique enterprise and partnership and just absolutely delighted that you could join us today and you, share Peter. that with with us so thank you very much peter and camilla really really appreciate it Pleasure. thank um, you so much folks we will of course continue with this series throughout 2022 so do uh, tune in again to the reinvented legal business the case studies uh, series. We'll uh, post lots of information about forthcoming sessions. And of course, when this session is available as well um, for you, both as a video and as a podcast. So follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter, and you'll find that information as well. And if it's not obvious, we're both really passionate about this. So if you have <laughs> any questions, please send us an email. My phone number is also on my webpage. I, I will talk your ear happily for hours and yeah folks you definitely find them on linkedin and just do want to underscore that i know both peter and camilla are really really happy to take your questions and genuinely engage with you as well so thank you everyone for coming and again um peter and camilla thank you so much for a fantastic presentation and kick off for the series for 2022 thank you terry and good luck with the rest of the series thank you very much bye bye